This is Scott Richmond and Arnie Sherman. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. Arnie, good Sunday morning to you. It's always a good Sunday morning when we're getting ready to talk about food. Yeah. We've migrated away from food for a bit, but now we're back on our favorite topic. Totally. And we're bringing in somebody that we haven't had in here for over three years. A friend. Yes, Drake Dobke, who uh, who launched in, in Missoula, Sakatumi, and then uh, Michi Ramen Bar. Right. And when those first hit the marketplace, we had him in here. We haven't had him in here since. So we want to hear about what's been going on, and he's the new co Owner and, and co proprietor of uh, of Florabella. Be- Florabella. No, it's exciting. You know, we love talking about food, and he's a foodie. And he's been traveling all over the world eating food. At the same time, he's been developing his restaurant. So it's good to hear what he's thinking about the industry, what he's thinking about how this all fits in here, what the market looks like, what's happening in the restaurant business in Missoula. It's uh, all good, and it'll make me hungry. You know how a, a community values its 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 influencers, its leaders, your politicians, your 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 community civic minded leaders. Uh, Drake is a leader because he's bringing great food into the community. Sure, right? He's introducing us to some really challenging dishes, interesting dishes at Sakatimi, right? Yep, ramen, which is we knew was an underserved market, and you and I both loved when he sure when opened he opened that up. And we've always been hankering for great Italian. Yep. And now we have uh, all three, and we're going to hear more about it. Yeah. And we, we do know that, like, rising tides lift all boats. And so when you bring rest, good restaurants in, it just ups everybody else's game. Yeah, they have to. Because who's going to want to go get a grilled cheese sandwich somewhere when you have all these other options? <laughs> you have to put some bacon on it and some you know Parmesan <laughs> on the outside to crisp it up. You're right. Well, Arnie and I are going to talk about our favorite subject, food, with one of our favorite guests, Drake Depke, back after this. Arnie, we are back with our guest, Drake Depke. Drake, you know, it's been a good while since you were last here in the studio with us. At that time, you know, Mishi Ramen had opened and your second socket, Tumi, had opened. And now you've migrated into some other sorts of things. But for our listeners... Could you kind of go way back and give us sort of the, the history of how you got to where you are now, and then we can catch up with what you're doing today? Yeah, it sounds good. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so I guess if you want to know the, the history, so... We don't need to hear about childbirth. No, or no, the, we're, the we're not going to go that. We're but, not going that far back. But your professional career. Yeah, yeah so... You know, we started it in Big Fork with the original Sakatumi, and it was, I mean, it was the most shoestring that it could possibly be. So people see the stuff that's going on now and don't realize that that's sort of, the genesis was, I mean, we, we started it with $10,000. So and what year was that? It was in 09. 09. And it was, I mean, you can't, I didn't even know you could start a restaurant with that little. I mean, we had like... <laughs> We had old you could start a, maybe a food truck, maybe, right? Uh, maybe, dude. I mean, like we had, we had old equipment, like freezers that didn't have like, like doors on it that we had to duct tape close, and we had, you know, a, like a old kegerator that was a refrigerator that I had to reach into to like grab stuff out of for service. We had ice bins that were acting as you know uh, mise en place. So yeah, it was um, it was about as shoestring as you could get. So you had less That's than ten thousand dollars, and you started a restaurant in two thousand nine in Big in Fork. Big Park, yeah. What was your thinking at that time? You had you ever run a restaurant before? Well, I've been working in them, you know, since I could work basically, and I was living in a called it the Holy Van in Hawaii. <laughs> uh, it was holy for you know double entendre. It, it it had holes in it, and it was holy. Uh, so, you know, you kind of had to say a prayer before you started it type of thing. And I was ready. I was was like, look, I'm tired of living in the holy van on the beach. Working for someone else. Working for somebody else. So it, uh, made sense to, we, I called up and said, Hey, is there anything available in Big Fork? And there was this unit and that's where we still are today. So. And you were from Montana before that, before Correct. you went to Hawaii. Yeah. Where, yeah. In Mo- where in Montana? Big Drake? Fork. Okay. Yeah, Big Fork. So that was home so base. that was home, so it seemed like an obvious place to kind of So in this time, back to. you've been working since you were working, and you're right. 
you were working in some in variety of restaurants, including right. a sushi yeah, sushi kind of place. was the last. Sushi was the last stint, so that's what I was. Most so, did you start with. thinking about doing your own place and taking down ideas and recipes, and before you ever started, or you just made the switch and then try to figure out what you were going to do? Yeah, it was a bit of both. I mean, you, you kind of you're working, the, you know, you're working it, so you kind of have an idea of what your catalog is going to be and what you what you like to do and what you think works right. and stuff like that. So we kind, of, you know, I already knew what the food would be and kind of the sourcing and how we were going to be how it would work. But, like, the business side of it, oh, my God, man, that was completely shoot from the hip. Like, I didn't know how to run QuickBooks. I didn't know how, like, we right. had, like, old paper, like, <laughs> register, old paper checks. I mean, that's how we started. I mean, like, even though the technology existed, like, Aloha was out by then. They didn't have, right. like, the newer systems that right. they do now. But, I mean, they had, like, I just was like, I mean, we didn't have the money. We were so, piecing like, it together. Yeah, right, so, so the, you were Especially from the business perspective. Right, the business was, side, but also on the food side. You're a foodie yourself, I know that. Sure. And mm-hmm. so you uh, you found things that you liked. Exactly, yeah. And were you sure that Montana's taste buds were prepared for what you were used to eating? Not at all. And in fact, it was like, at first people were like, what is this, fish bait? You know, and yeah. I'm like, oh, right. man, like, this, I don't know if this is going to work. You well, know? you know, it, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> I mean, Montana's culinary mm. palate has developed. It's massively, yes. Massively. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't that long ago people were asking for ketchup in Italian restaurants to put on for top sure. of spaghetti. For sure. Yeah. Well, well, let's be clear. So Montanans have actually developed a palate. Yes. But we've always had people coming from California, New York, New Jersey. You know, visitorship has increased, and they always they, – they were used to this, right, like you and I. But right. Montanans, locals, want this now. They're asking for, which is a I think that's difference. the biggest difference that you start to see now yeah. is that the the places that are doing kind of the higher end or like totally. not the higher end, but just like you know more like the technique based, like trying to right. do like the you know the good ingredients, the, like that's what's actually driving the market now. Like those are the successful places, the ones that do that are working on trying to deliver the highest quality product where that wasn't true when I, right. when I came down to Missoula, even six years ago. Well, you know, wow. one of the things I think you'd agree that has helped that along is a lot of the media focus on celebrity chefs. I mean, lot, most people didn't know who Anthony Bourdain was right. And mm-hmm. he became a media sensation. And then you have Gordon Ramsay. You got all these shows on TV. It's hard to flip through TV and not see a food related mm-hmm. show. And if you start mm-hmm. watching it, you start getting, Interested in it? For I've sure. never had that. Where can I find that? For sure. Who's doing it? And then you notice that there's a, there's a gradient, that there's a scale, oh, and right? That there is differences between like that. There is a difference between what this was and what it is, and you know, exactly. So you start to see the differences, and I think that just wasn't really as prevalent, right? For a while. You know, so so you have Saka to me in uh, Big Fork. You started in two thousand nine, and then and then how did that snowball? Well, yeah. So we did that for a couple years. Um, and then I just realized that it was like, okay, this is like, this is a pretty small market. I mean, like, it's very cool because like what you're saying, there's a lot of people that are coming from, you know, California, Arizona, they have got second homes or whatever. So they really, they really wanted that, right, right. like what they were used to. So right. that really kind of propelled us forward. Um, but then the locals caught on as well. So yeah, it ended up working out, but it's still like, you know, I mean, it's a very seasonal market. You've got about three months of hay. And then the rest of the time you're like, wow, this is like, we know this is a good product. We know if there was people, here, right. we would be busy. And so, you know, we started looking at other markets. And so like Zula became a fairly obvious market for us because it was only an hour and a half away, right. a lot more people and stuff like that. We knew that if we could deliver the same product that, we'd be busier more often. And there was also the advantage of having a a college workforce to find, you know, employees because that's always a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Restaurants struggle with that for sure. But you know, I mean, if you take care of them, there's, they're out there for sure. So, so then Sakitumi in Missoula happened, Mm -hmm. developed. And when did that open? That was 2018. So it's been five years now. Right. Wow. It's five years. Isn't that wild? And That's, then it was like yesterday. Know, there was a so downstairs. <laughs> there, there was a downstairs under it, right? right? So right. then we got Mishi Ramen Bar. That's right. Yeah. So there was this like it used to be like an old prep kitchen for the McKinsey River, and like it, it looked weird. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it was like you would not have imagined Michi when you went down there the first time. It was all like 
right. know, FRP on the walls. And it was just, <laughs> it was pretty dingy. You know, I mean, it wasn't dingy in the right. sense that it was like dirty, but it was just, you, it's not what it is. It's now. a basement. <laughs> but once we started peeling off the walls and we realized like, wow, there's some really cool like, work uh, down here. It's like, we can make this look really cool. Um, just by cleaning up that old like glacier rock foundation that's right. underneath all these old buildings down in Missoula. So there's, there's a lot of these cool basements in Missoula that um, can, can look that way. So we were, we were excited. To so you, but sorry to interrupt you, Arnie, but this brings up a great point, which is you have a, an idea and a flair uh, from the art and aesthetic perspective for the food, but also for the decor and for the atmosphere. Where did that come from? You know, I don't really know. I think it's been developed over time. Because uh-huh. like, when I, when I, I mean, the, the place I used to work at in Hawaii, like, they didn't have to do much. Right. You just look out the window, there's 18 waterfalls. Like, you didn't, like, you, you just put a window in, it wasn't like a big deal. Right. And, like, um, and a lot of the restaurants I'd worked in, they, you know, they, had, they were doing it, but they, it was just more of like kind of simple classic look um, that I've worked in previously. And then, you know, maybe they were funky in some way, but they weren't like, and, and that, that side of it has just gotten so much better. Like the design of restaurants, it's become such like an important piece. Sure. Of it. And I really think it is. Yeah. That's why we value artists and artwork because it's like, it's just, it, it's gotta be kind of a five sensory encompassing thing. So that's been something that's developed. It's developed. I've, I've, developed that skill set and how have you been inspired to do that because i know you travel traveling is probably your biggest inspiration okay you see a couple of places that are doing it and you're like damn this is like we we gotta step our game up a little isn't it amazing to walk into a place that's doing something you've never seen before and it's so cool we gotta get a little we we gotta we gotta start bringing this in you know so i mean but you you know if you spend time in the space you just inevitably you start looking at the walls and be like oh you know what would be cool if we did this so you start working it like that and then you and then it becomes just like any other skill set. But I think it is tied with the food. Like if you like, if you like beautiful things, you want to be in a beautiful space. You want beautiful food. You want, you know, it all starts to kind of. Tie how do you together. how do you manage the the staff and the the workforce that you bring in for your restaurants? Because service industry is notoriously a tough job. Like it's a lot of work. It's, it's a lot physically of physically demanding. It's physically demanding, but it's also emotionally demanding because. It can be. Right. Yeah. And there, you know, it's not a surprise. A lot of folks that work in the service industry do fall prey to, you know, medic over medicating themselves to deal with the challenges of working and long hours and, you know, a client or a customer saying this tastes a lot like what I was expecting. And you're disapp- they're disappointed and you're just being the receiver of all that. Like, how do you help a recruit for a staff that you feel is going to in a proper and premium way Two, how do you deal with staff where there are challenges? Um, I used to be kind of a little bit more high strung, I think like, and it's something that I had to work on. Like, you, you know, like you want to create, like take away that feeling from a management, from an ownership perspective. So they're mm-hmm. not getting hammered on like both sides. Like, cause you know that like the customers are going to be demanding and might have complaints and there might be that emotional fatigue coming from one side, regardless, we can't control that. Mm-hmm. But from, but from the managerial ownership side, we try to make sure that we ensure that it's a, like a fair kind, you know, like relatively peaceful environment on our side that we're, that we have their back. I mean, cause you're only as strong as your people. Like I, none of this, like this is all, this is a team deal, man. And like, it, it takes the team. And so you got to definitely find those people and then make sure that you take care of them. And it means that it's in compensation, but it's also in just the environment that you create and make sure that you're, you know, I mean, you have to, you know, there's times where you have to be exact about what you want, but you right. can do it in a way where you're not, uh, you're not, you're not lording over. People. Yeah. You're you not know, putting an extra burden that is yeah, not necessary. Don't, don't add a burden. Life's hard enough, you know? So, sure. Um, so that's something I've really tried to cultivate as well. It's just like your culture, the culture of it is to make sure that it's a, like, it's a good place to be, that it's a healthy place to be. It's a good environment. And your customers looking forward to being there. Like they're going there with great expectations. They're going to have a great meal. Right. They're going to have a great, you know, sit, you know, just three hours of time. It's one hand washes the other. Right. I mean, like, right. If, if, if I'm stressing out my staff, like unnecessarily, then 
they can feel that. The customers feel that. All of a sudden, you're like, well, why does it feel this way? And it's like, right. because like there's just this vibe that's right. to get created. Now, if they like want to be there, then they, then they start having love for the game. They want to be there. They want to take care of you because you take care of them. It's really, it's, it's fairly simple, but it seems to be elusive. In, in some you know, and in some places yeah. in the world, it's, it's considered more of a, a profession Correct. than it is here. When I stayed at, uh, um, I, I was in uh, Paris and stayed at one of the uh, top hotels, the Bristol. Right. And the head of customer relations in the hotel had been there 31 years. And he was still enthusiastic and well-dressed and well taken care of. And I was there when you still had to have a COVID test. And right. I went up to him, his name was Jean, and I said, Jean, I need a COVID test. And he said, well, would you like the doctor to come to, come to your room? Mm-hmm. We'll make all the arrangements for you. That kind of environment where you feel like you have right. some control and the person, you know, has some confidence and some pride in his job, you know, makes it last. You know, 30, you don't find 30 year employees very often in restaurants and bars and nightclubs and night spots in the U.S. I mean, I would like to see it shift that direction to more of like a um, profession, more considered to be. I mean, there's such like a negative connotation when it comes to like a server. It's like, oh, you're just going to be a server forever. It's like, yeah, maybe. Because what are we really talking about? We're right. talking about food and wine and hanging out with the with the community. Like, yeah. Well, if you're a isn't ser- that what you're doing? There's reasons why people come here to hang out. Like, so right. why is it such? And like, in some markets like San Francisco, why is that New- a negative thing? I don't in, in markets like New York and San Francisco, servers in, in good restaurants make one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. These guys are killing. It. They really right. are killing. Like, it. So, but it's also employees that believe in you and see your success and the success of the restaurant as their success. Yeah, they, right? they, they get take the ownership. long game. Right. Yeah, yeah. They take ownership for sure. So let's go back to the timeline. So now you have three mm-hmm. restaurants. Correct. Your your strength up until this point has not been management and the business side of things. Well, I'm so, learning. Right. right. At, at I, that point. I, yeah. But now, have you brought, did you bring in other uh, people to be on the management side of things at yeah, three I have restaurants? Great managers. I mean, that's really how. I mean, it's top to bottom. You got to have a great dishwasher and you have a great management. But management is definitely that. There's no way to expand without right. having people that you can trust and that really understand the vision and really want to carry it forward. And and so, yeah, management is super critical. So I have good managers in Big Fork. I've got good managers down here, and that's what makes it go. So, so things are cruising along, doing well, and then COVID hits. Yeah. What yeah. did that do to your business? Um, you know, it, it was just like it was like a fire in a kitchen, man. <laughs> You just got to like, you got to start, you got to address the problem. So it's like, okay. And, and the hardest thing about that was like, it was such a moving target. We didn't really know like what, what was going to happen. What was happening. We didn't know what was going on. So like, you, you know, we weren't really getting like, no one knew. So it wasn't like, there was no one you could call. You couldn't call like the city and just say like, right. they were just like, oh, I don't know. I mean, like, so every day was just kind of a new fire that had to be put out. Um, so it was it was a challenge, but honestly, in a way, restaurants were kind of equipped for that because that's sort of what we're we're in like, right. problem solution management like all the time. So yeah. like right. it was just it was just an added component, but um, it was it's like yeah, I mean this is what we're doing. We're always putting out fires. Right, so, right. It's just another bigger fire. It's just a bigger and a longer different, fire, different fire. Yeah, um, and then just not really kind of knowing how it was supposed to be done and what was really going to be the most of like, like, cause there was the, there was the regulatory side that was saying, okay, you can do this or you can't do this. But then there was like the actual side of like trying to get information about what was right. going, then, like going on from, right. Like from a CDC side or from like, I mean, cause and then, and no then, one kind of knew what was going on. So right, it's like, then, is this responsible? Is it irresponsible? Like what is the right thing to do? And then you have the supplier issues, right? Yeah. And then that was, yeah, that was a massive other thing that happened. It, you know, during and post, and we're still kind of sure in, in that you know um, era of it's it's getting better for sure. But so you come out of COVID, you got mm-hmm. three locations. They're all in sort of the you know the Asian seafood area, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden I read about hear about you can open an <laughs> Italian restaurant, Florabella. So yeah. tell me about how this this offshoot came about. Well, so it was during COVID, right? Like, and we were, I just kept driving by, you know, Cafe Dolce, the old Cafe, Cafe Dolce. And I was like, man, that's just such like a shame that that isn't like great building going. And um, it was, yeah, such a great building. And we were looking at doing another project. 
that was a little farther out, and I just drove by the building, and I was like, man, like, I wonder if we can get Cafe Dolce. Like, so I talked to my buddy who's a real estate agent, and he was like, I was like, look, what would it take? Kind of came to a number to offer, mm -hmm. offered it, and we got a counter back, which it wasn't like, sometimes, you know, you just get dead air on the other side <laughs> right, after you right. make an offer. So we, but we got a counter that was really not off of our initial. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, hey, we were able to, able to get it done. So, and, you know, it just seems so, I mean, the building is so Lake Como. I mean, like it's such Northern yeah. Italian. It's hard design. to think about putting like something it's else in there, right? Be Italian. It's beautiful. And, and we also knew that there was just such, that there was a need for like more of a contemporary Italian restaurant. It was something that wasn't being, I thought, represented as much as it could be, or right. that there was more, there was more space, you know, for, for something like that. And um, you have outdoor space. Yeah. The patio everything. was so it's Amazing. dope. Yeah. And I just <laughs> love that building, dude. Yeah, it's dope. For and sure. you brought, <laughs> it's a great building. Yeah. And you brought a partner in, though. Correct. Ben, so, ben Berta. Yeah. Is this your first partner? This is my first partner. Okay, so and, this is new. How's that? It's a new thing. It's, it's great because, I mean, I in order to grow, you kind of have to. I mean, you want people who are in and invested and who can be you if you're not there. Right. So uh, he's that for sure. And he's got a great knowledge of, uh, European cuisine, spent a lot of time in Italy and Spain and France and like knows the stuff frontwards and backwards and um, also has a great lineage of operations. So he knows, you know, he knows how to set them up. He knows how to like train. He knows how to do all that stuff. So it's, it's uh yeah, it's, I couldn't have asked for kind of more in a partnership in that way because I, you know, you can't do everything. I mean, eventually you just run out of bandwidth. Right. So right. you got to start incorporating other people into the fray. And then Ben, at the same time, just mm. to make things yeah, right. more complicated, he's opening another restaurant. Yeah, downtown yeah, bar wild. restaurant yeah, simultaneous. I mean, he opened that like legitimately. I was like, "Are you sure you want to do this?" I mean, we're working on this other thing, and he was like, "Yeah, I can do it." And he was able to pull it off. Dude, this is the both. place that's on uh, next to the Wilma Plata. Plata, Plata okay. Which has Spanish tapas. And, yeah, it's like and a, a bar. conservas bar. Which yeah, it's is a really small, cool. It's a cool it's, idea. I it's mean, exactly we, what you see in like Spain. I mean, right. it is what wow. it is. Like, Portugal, a lot of places. Yeah. You, 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 there are hundred of them. spaces that are like that are serving conservas. You sit on awesome. the bar and you get a little small plates of you know olives or cheeses yeah, or meats right. and you drink local wines and. And then, of course, here we don't drink local wines. No, we don't, no, right, right. But <laughs> regional wines yeah, here. Right, 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 right. Do we know what's going into where El Cazador used to be? I don't. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> see, I always have a nose I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that later. <laughs> let's let's focus becoming, on that. He's fast becoming <laughs> the uh, Mario, what's his name, Batali? Oh, don't, don't brand me to that guy. <laughs> <laughs> like, How about Jeff Ruby? Italy. How about Cincinnati? Italy. Jeff Ruby, who's got about eight places. In Jeff Germany. Ruby. Yeah. My, uh, my nephew is, is executive chef for Jeff Ruby. Let's do a quick Cincinnati. ID. Uh, you're, uh, Jake uh, Depke is our guest here on What Do You Know? Drake, I have a question. So you did some traveling recently because, you know, we're connected via socials. Mm -hmm. And you were doing a lot of eating and drinking along the way. Where were you and what were you doing? Yeah, so I was in the Valtellina, which is like the northern part of Italy. It's uh, kind of a lesser known area. It's part of the Italian Alps. Uh, it borders Switzerland. Um, and buddy of mine has a place out there, so went out there and spent some time with him. It's awesome. It's where like the 2026 Olympics are going to be. Yeah, Bormio, very cool area. It's like it's very like it's very Montana, frankly. Is it? Yeah, I mean it's like mountains, ski resorts, hot springs, like it's all the stuff. It's a little food. Italian. Out. If you go a little <laughs> south, you have Brescia and you have Lago di Garda, the big lake that looks like Flathead Lake. Well, yeah, I mean Como's an hour yeah. away from the vault, so yeah. like, and it's exactly like Flathead Lake, except that it's like Castle Town <laughs> all over it, <laughs> yeah. little wood cigarette boats instead of yeah, you know. So it's uh, it's a very Pontoons. cool area. I had I had never. You know, my, if my buddy hadn't got a place out there, I wouldn't have probably ended up there. And it's but really it's neat. It's awesome. And there's this green belt that goes around, like, the. it's kind of midway up the mountains. Yeah. And that's where everyone lives. Like, all the towns are kind of midway up the mountains because just the way that the thermoclines are there, there's kind of this fog in the in the valley floor uh, where there's, like, a river. I mean, it's Montana, man. I'm that's so cool. Yeah. And, then, and then there's this green belt that kind of wraps around the, the, the valley. Yeah. And... It's where they grow the olives, and they got the dairy cows, and they got the grapes, and it's Nebbiolo. So I mean, it's some of the rarest 
best wine in the world, and they can grow it in this region. It's pretty wild. Yeah. It's a really interesting part. A lot of people, when they go to Italy, don't go to northern Italy. They no, go to no. Sicily, or they go Rome. Milan's like the farthest, right? They'll yeah, Milan, right. They won't they go north. Go above, so. it's pretty How cool. cool is that? How long are you away for? Uh, I mean, right now I can only get away for a couple weeks at a time. So I was there for like two and a half weeks. Uh, spent most of the time in the Valtellina, some time in Milan, and then we went to Paris for... Isn't that great, Arnie, to be able to go to Italy for two and a half weeks and it's work? Oh, yeah, it's, work. it's work. Well, I taught, no, I know I taught it is. there for five, <laughs> I taught there for five summers and then at the for a two week Did intensive you? class, and then at the end of the class when students all were done, I would take a week or ten days and travel around that part of Italy, mostly the northern part. And, you know, the southern wing of that is like Milan, Bergamo, Verona, and then Venice. And then above that are the lakes, and then above that are the mountains. Right. Beautiful. It's, be- it's really it's a I mean, fantastic it's, it's area. It's where, like, Barolo is, which is, like, I mean, it's only two hours from Barolo and Alba where the famous truffles are. So we were there during Truffle Festival, wow. which was awesome. Yeah. Because you walk through, and everyone's got their little truffles, and you smell them, and they take, you know, I was so proud of them. And it's like, so I'm lucky if I travel to Anaconda for business. <laughs> I mean, this is great. You've got to work on this. Man. I know we got to know. <laughs> yeah, well, you I'm sure to... you can figure it out. <laughs> Did you have to go to Japan? When you... uh, I haven't been recently, but yeah, I mean, I have spent quite a bit of time in Japan. What did you think of that, like, when you were traveling there? I love it. Yeah. I think Japan's amazing. Everyone that goes loves it. I think it's amazing. It's It's got some of the best food culture probably in the world. Yeah. I mean, there's more... French Michelin star restaurants in Tokyo than there are in Paris. Yeah. I mean, like, it's just wild. Like, they're, 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 the dedication to the craft and the detail, and, like, I mean, it's it's astounding. Like, as far as the best food city in the world, in my opinion, it's Tokyo. Tokyo is fantastic. Yeah. The, one I've of the heard things, that I, I have a very limited bucket list after all these years of traveling. Right. But there's one place in Japan that's on my bucket list, and it's near Mount Fuji. It's the oldest hotel in the world. Oh, wow. It's been in the same family for 57 generations. Oh, my God. 57? 57. It opened in 1072 or something like that. And it's still there. And they've obviously upgraded it you know, 150 times right. or whatever. But it, it has this picturesque setting at the, at the base of you know, Mount Fuji, which most people have seen, that you know, white-capped, gorgeous right. mountain. And it's kind of like Mount Rainier, their version of Mount Rainier. Yeah, it kind of looks like that. But you know, it would be interesting to stay at the oldest hotel in the world. It would be. I mean, the stories, you know, the history, hearing people, and being in the same family for all those generations. Well, that's the way all, all those sake houses are. Yeah. It's like, if you, the, like, there's one called Pride of the Village, right? Right. Um, and it's on its 55th generational leader. So, like, <laughs> grandfather to son, or, you know, father yeah. to son, father to son, father to son, for 55 generations. Yeah, it's just incredible how that could so be. Zo- so, zoom in a little bit. So, internationally, Tokyo is your place. How about domestically? For food? For food. I mean, it's hard to be New York. But, I, I mean, L.A. is also extremely good. Uh it's just it's more of like treasure hunting there, but mm-hmm. I mean the the quality is, right. is definitely there. Um, and then Chicago, I mean Chicago is probably it's probably maybe the best food city in the U.S. In my opinion, is probably Chicago. But I don't want to go to Chicago right now. Well, yeah, I'm, I mean you know you gotta. I'm heading. It's in April. crazy. You I'm gotta wait through April. the violence, but yeah, I mean like but the food is on point. No, it's, I know. If you I like if you like a certain sliver of the food, you know pie. Going in April to New Orleans, and they have, I mean, if you like Creole food, if you like right. that kind of low country stuff, there's 40 good restaurants. For sure. You could, you could never in a, even in a month go to all the good places there. I would agree. Uh, yeah. I New mean, Orleans. it's hard to distill it into that because there's so yeah. much, I mean, there's so much good stuff. And I, I think what's cool about the way this, the whole technological exchange of like recipes and ideas, it's like right. you're really finding good food in a lot of more remote places. I mean, it's where good what, chefs end up going, right? Yeah, they, all of a sudden, there's a good Yellowstone chef somewhere. Club. Yeah, yeah. Big Fork. Yeah. yeah, go to Big Fork. How about Miami? There's, yeah. you know, if you Follow good Spanish, good Spanish restaurants down there, good Brazilian Asian restaurants. There. So, I mean, you're yeah. starting to see the chefs aren't as like, dim, like, right? They don't have to be in like L.A. or Chicago or New York. No, like before, if you wanted, right, to, you had to go and work in New York and work under a good chef. But now it's all open source stuff now so you're starting to see that look i can live in a place like missoula montana and 
you know, make a good living, make good food, make good food, make good living, do all that. So, 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 but could you live in Indianapolis? Question. (laughs) (laughs) Not to pick on Indianapolis, I'm sure there's some good restaurants there, but but it's not really. Well, how about Cincinnati? You spent time in Cincinnati. I mean, Cincinnati has a bunch of good restaurants. They used to have more starred restaurants. They, they, the two of the, of the, uh, of the biggest restaurants there, you know, have uh, since gone by the wayside, but they have other little sort of jewels. Like Aglamise's ice cream and chocolate shop that's been in the same location for a hundred years in Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. Greek family moving you know, there a hundred years ago. Or even if you're into, you know, Skyline Chili, it's been there a hundred years. For a hundred years. Yeah, Greek family doing the same sort of thing. I mean, they say it's like the golden age of travel. I think it's like in right. to be the golden age of travel, you have to have you have to have the services. Right. As you're traveling. And so I think that's what we're seeing right now is that we're seeing that like well, food is be- food is getting better along. The well, it's becoming the lead now. If you go look at some of the uh, upscale cruise lines now, where, you know, Ritz Carlton has cruises and you have Windstar, you have Regent, you have Seaborn. They're all publicizing James Beard Award chef is coming right. on the cruise, to, you know, to oversee what we're going to prepare for. You know, four hundred people. <laughs> you know, but but the, the food is now part become, of the menu. People yeah, it's don't become want part of the deal. Like you, you can't you, you can't just say, oh, we're going to do a beef Wellington or something and throw some green no. beans at them and be done. Well, like, no, the food has to be has part to be, of it. Well, the well, one to, place you did leave out, which I wanted to just loop back into, and you, you go, you've been there a lot. Is I remember when you used to go to Vegas and you're looking for the 99 cent shrimp special. Oh right! Well, now Vegas every name definitely. restaurant has ha, every name chef in the world practically. It's got a place now That's in true. Vegas. That's true for sure. I mean they've they've been able to attract like all the star chefs, and so you're right. I mean that is probably one of the culinary destinations. T- now. Tell us about Florabella. Let's talk yeah, a little bit about, about that. The sure. new talk about that. Like talk about the menu. What's the inspiration behind all of that, and what your what your vision is? Yeah. First, first, yeah, before yeah. we start, the name. Where did the name come from? How'd you come up with Florabella? Uh, you know, we just Ben and I kicked it around, and uh, yeah, Florabella was kind of the one that uh, floated the top. It's you know, it's kind of a play on beautiful flower, even though yeah. it's not actually literally right, but it uh-huh. just it just it looks yeah. right. It sounds right. It I sounds like right. And yeah. It looks right. And it's like near. It's near Rose Park. You know, it's like a flower in Missoula. I don't know. It's and just, flour <laughs> you use in Italian restaurant to make pizza and bread. Yeah, and all exactly. That kind of stuff. So There's a lot of double right. entendre going on. So, yeah right yeah. yeah yeah exactly so the menu and the vibe yeah so i mean once again that the vibe is like really super critical for me now like the design and the like i really think that's a super critical piece so uh you know it, it was a beautiful building hats off to peter lambos for what he built and uh, it's beautiful it's he really did create a, a, a beautiful building but it did need we did need to kind of we needed to update it we needed to touch pretty much every surface in there. I mean, the only thing uh-huh. that we didn't was the floor, but uh, we felt that it would, it needed, it needed to be done in a different way. It wasn't necessarily worse than what he had or anything like that, but we just wanted, or better than what he had going on, but we just felt like it needed an update. So we had to go through and touch every surface um, and change a lot of the stuff. And then we had to update the kitchen for kind of what we wanted to do. So, I mean, it had to be changed. So we, so that was the first thing. And then we were, uh, we knew that we needed like a big piece of center artwork just because of the way the building is shaped. It's like a, it's a box, right? Right. With a very, with a very tall ceiling. So we were like, what are we going to put on the ceiling? You know, it was, well, you know, Michelangelo fresco, right? Of course. You got right. Right. The, right. the fresco was up there and we're like, man, you know, that's kind of our style. So, uh, it just so happened that we got in contact with this Wolf Magritte, who's like a fabricator here in town. And he works with this artist, Kendall Buster, who's, out of New York, and he's like, "Look, I bet Kendall will do something. She's never done something on this side of the country before, or you know, nothing in Montana. We've never installed anything in Montana. And it just so happens that their workshop is here in Missoula. So wow. like, we would love to to do something. So it just became a great marriage there with those guys, and we did that uh, big piece of artwork in the middle of the room. So that was like how those elements kind of came to be. It was just sort of things kind of just fell into place, which was really fun to watch. Just on. Unf- and, and then you redesigned a little bit of the concept. I mean, before when it was open for coffee in the morning, you walked into the whole main restaurant. Now you have sort of a coffee. Yeah. What, what used to be the, the pottery yeah. the alcove has now sort of become the... Uh, yeah, so that was like Peter really wanted it to be like a daytime thing and then kind of felt himself pushed into right. the night where we're coming from a different direction. Right. We're saying, 
look, we're more of like night and we're going to figure out how to do the day. But right. I mean, he really helped us in the sense of like setting up that lunch culture. Cause then we just, we realized that we couldn't just do the cafe. Cause that was the original idea was that little cafe on the side was going to be kind of our, our, our lunch. And it was more to be like, Hey, it's just here for, right. You know, you're just getting espresso and maybe like a little pastry or biscotti or maybe a little panini. It was meant to be kind of small service. Right. But the demand was so much for lunch because of what it had been before. So sure. we're like, sure. oh, my God, we have to do lunch now. Like, we can't not open for lunch because it had already had been such established in that way. So we, we kind of went from the other way. We knew that it was going to be a nighttime and designed it that way. Okay. And then added the lunch, which we had to do pretty much immediately, which we hadn't planned on doing. Well, but. because it's, it's sort of the university neighborhood kind of crowd that would – you know, go there. At lunch. Right. I mean, it was just a go-to place. Yeah, it's their place. neighborhood spot. It's right. a neighborhood spot, mm-hmm. but they want a, a better. You know, they don't want to just have a, a lunch encounter, a neighborhood spot. They want to have a real restaurant. Maybe. To relax. Right, exactly. Well, yeah. my observation, just going inside to seeing that it, it's laid out in a more. It feels a little more full. It feels more like a restaurant. It didn't. There seemed to be a lot of open space when it was Cafe Dolce. Well, because he designed it as like to be kind of specifically that way. That was right. his vision. Well, originally when they it opened, it like was going to be a coffee place. That's it was what a it coffee was, place was a that coffee. had ice cream. And so, you know, you kind of find yourself getting kind of forced in certain directions yeah. based on demand and things like that. So I think they, they kind of got the, they were like, okay, we have to do this. We have to do this. Right. We have to do this. And, you know, it's it's something that you struggle with as a restaurant owner because you're like, look, this is what I want. But it's like, okay, well, it doesn't really matter what you want in right. a way. I mean, it does. You have to stay, like, true to your vision. But, like, but it's still what the – it's still – you're still serving people. And this right. Whole thing is like. people. And it's, you know, you got to kind of play this balance of, like, look, this is what we have in mind, but this is what people And what about the mind. menu? Like, what's – like, talk about the menu. Yeah, so the menu um, – you know, it was conceptualized, and um, Michael Hannigan, who we brought on, is our um, executive chef for it. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't have the bandwidth to do that portion of it anymore. And, you know, Ben is doesn't have the bandwidth because he's doing the operation side for the, you know, f- for the entirety of the project. So you can't, like, so he, we brought in Michael, and Michael's very good. Um, he's very diligent, very hardworking, very talented, creative guy. So... He's been a lifesaver in that way. And then the crew he brought on is very professional and very good. So uh, it's it's really dependent on that team because, mm-hmm. I mean, you can want to do a lot of cool stuff, but, you know, you got to make sure that you can execute all that stuff. Right, so, right. It's, so having him be a part of the team is really critical. Um, but, you know, the original thing was we just wanted to do kind of more of a contemporary Italian but. What that really means is, like, we really just want to be making pasta and making our own bread and making our own – because that's Italian food, man. I mean, like, right. Italian food is supposed to be simple, but with, like, good ingredients, good execution, cooked correctly, you know, tempt correctly. Like, pasta is inherently not that hard, but it is. Like, right. It is, like, you can screw pasta up. You can up. screw it up really easily <laughs> because of its simplicity. Right. So you got to be kind of exact on how you do it. So, like – but that – you know, we want to make it so that it's a place where people don't feel like, you know, threatened by the menu, but there's also a lot of cool stuff on it. Right. But, you know, it's, it's a, Italian is a familiar cuisine. Like, sure. It's like these flavors right. are familiar. We're talking about cheese and pork and chicken and beef and then like, you know, and tomato some, and tomato. I mean, this is stuff that like, it's right. not like the sushi world where it's like, okay, here's some sea urchin. <laughs> and people are like, what the hell <laughs> is that? You know, so... It is different Treaters. in that regard, but you have to, because it's something that everyone recognizes, you have to be really good at it. Yeah. So, so we have a lot of bakeries in town. Mm-hmm. Why did you decide to make your own? I think it's just like, it's such an Italian thing again, man. You got to make your own stuff, man. So, and yeah. we, uh, our baker is in from um, Wild Crumb out of Bozeman and, you know, they were just nominated for a James Beard or whatever. And she's really talented and she's really good. And it's so fun for her. To, like I, it's fun for me to watch her like geek out on that side. And then it just makes it a house thing. And it's like, it's house pasta, yeah. it's house sauce, it's house bread. Like, yeah, you know, we're making our stuff. Yeah. Like, you know, somebody, I, I was there for coffee and then I took one of your loaves, the olive loaf mm-hmm. and I'm on trying to lose weight. And <laughs> by the time I got home, a third of the loaf was <laughs> Yeah. Because it was exactly, it, right. it yeah. was perfect. Right. It had the crunchy, crispy, 
Yes. Crust and the soft, warm, mm. and in, in, in inside. And it had the all. I mean, it was it was really well yeah, done. Yeah, she's she's really tough. It was really good. They're, they're yeah, they're getting they're having some. Fun. It's going to be fun. What are the watch. hours? Are the of the? Uh, the so the cafe is open. So currently, we're not open during. Mondays, which eventually we probably will change that, right. but we just kind of need like prep day and order day. Like Regroup just to, on this. Especially early on. We just need to make sure that everything yeah. it gives us a time to ch- catch up. It also gives us time to do some like little odds and construction projects and stuff. So right now we're closed on Mondays and then the cafe, which is the coffee shop, that opens at eight o'clock and that goes till two o'clock. And then the the lunch kicks off at like 11 and that goes you know, through the night into four. You Are know. you doing sandwiches at the cafe? So the cafe is more of like your pickup pastry bread, like biscotti, your coffee, right? Like, and and we may kind of move there. We may kind of move into more of like small grab and go panini type of stuff from there. But no, the the we. The right. lunch kicks off at 11, and that's when it's like sandwiches and salads and pizza. Well, it's more like a real Gaza, Italian place. Italians like don't eat heavy breakfasts. You don't no, go to I mean, an Italian just, coffee just, place, just a little something to go with the coffee. That's right. That's sort to of To go the with deal. your latte or your cappuccino in the morning. Right. You know, t- one of the things I mentioned to someone the other day about spending time in Italy, and, and uh, I think Drake knows this, is somebody will say, let's go for coffee in the morning, and it's not unusual for them to stop off at two or three places on the way to work. Yeah, they go to one for their cappuccino. They go to one because they got a nice little pastry that they like, and they get another. Then they get an espresso there, and then they hit the last one. And that's a typical thing, which is very unusual. Yeah, you know, you know in New York, you go to Dunkin', you know, and grab your coffee and a donut, and you're gone. When there, you're swinging in for espresso all the time, I mean, yeah. like, oh, I'm feeling a little peckish. Like, yeah, yeah let's <laughs> just get an espresso. Like, I mean, it's but it's, it would take but me. It's, it's effective. It works. Yeah, like that, it's like, hey, I'm gonna just go have a little quick espresso and then like move on with my day. So I'm in Brescia, and my friend there, Guido Cupolo, says, "I'll pick you up and take you to the university because I was teaching the university." And it's like 15 minutes. I said, "Well, no, I'll walk." He said, "No, no, I'll pick you up. We'll get some coffee." It took me 45 minutes to an hour to get we, there because we stopped at. Oh, we got to stop here for this and here for this. Well, you're bringing up a really good, you bring up a good point, which is time, Drake. How do you split your time <laughs> yes. between three restaurants? I mean, it's hard. Don't get me wrong. I mean, but it it's really, you're only as good as your people, right? So, like, having, like, getting them to buy into the, getting them to buy into the vision and everyone's, like, kind of on the same page, then, you know, then you can, you can, yeah. you don't have to be there all the time. I mean, there is no possible way I could be at any place right. all the time. Like, it's, that this is what, this is what we're doing and we all agree on it and it's kind of like, and everyone kind of knows what they're responsible for. I mean, it's uh, many hands, you know, make the load light. Four well, let's say I was at I was at Sakatumi the other day for mm-hmm. uh, for sushi, and they had uh, a sushi that was new on the menu that had foie gras. The, mm-hmm. the, approve new items that go on the menu because they have cost implications, right? If somebody's buying fo- foie gras, it's more expensive than just you know tuna or salmon. I mean, I'm still, yeah, I'm, I'm. There's certain things I really care about, right? And like you know, I mean. Do I care what wine comes on and off the wine list? Not really. It's not like, I mean, I do care in the sense that it's like, I do want great wine on the menu, but it's not like my, like, I don't, if they move that around a little bit, as long as they're in their cost stuff, it doesn't really bother me. Things that I really care about are like, you know, the management, the management hires and the, who's on like kind of that team, right. because that's somebody that I'm going to be dealing with. So that's an important, that's really important for me. And then the menu is like, I, it, it's just, it's, it's my background, it's, and I really care about it. So, like, and you enjoy that, um, yeah. And it's what I do. So, it's like I'm still very much involved in the menu, and they, we, we all work together. We can like and come up with what's sure be good, coming on or coming off, and things like that. And let me, still let me doing some recipe creations. Let's take a quick break. Our guest is Drake Depke. He is with now Floribella, but also Michi Ramen and Sakatumi. Back after this. Arnie, we are back with our guest, Drake Depke. So at the same time you're developing new restaurants, there's a lot of other new restaurants that have come into Missoula, and they're in, many of them are in the same price point. So what's your thoughts on the new competition that's brewing? Because there's just so many dollars you can spend on you know, high-quality food, and our population is not New York. And so so what, what's your thoughts about how the, oh, I the, think it's the, good. the new competition? I think it's good. I, I think it's that, you know, 
rising tides raise all ships. I think like you want to have it, it's it, it also sets the standard at a higher it raises the bar basically for for all of us to make sure that we're on top of our stuff. So I yeah I actually think it's uh, it's all positive to be honest with you. Yeah, the only blowback that I've heard just is is that in, and it's happened. It's not just here; it's everywhere. It's that the prices have now kind of not just inched up; they've kind of grown by inflation's more. been pretty pretty real so i mean like the fact is is we're paying twice as much for crab that now than we were last year yeah so we can't raise our prices by twice as much even though our cost has gone up twice right. as much in, certain, in right. some cases so like i mean it's across the board so like it's one of these things where we're all kind of having to play the stance a little bit. It's not like we're saying you, the customer, fronts the whole load, but like we can't front Fr- the whole load are you o- either. So. No. Are you okay with not? You're just beer and wine there, right? At, at Flora, at yeah. Flora. Mm-hmm. Any chance of getting a full license? No, I think it's perfect with that. I think it's exactly. You what don't it need be. it, right? Yeah, I think it's what. Fits not with that, Italian. Fits Italian that is that model. Wine, I mean, don't get me wrong. It'd be nice to have an Aperol spritz, but if we don't need it, there's right. some very cool Italian cocktails out there, but it's not. It's, it's not, not what, what that place it's is. It's not essential to not the operation. So. Right. So what are we missing in the market that we don't have? If you were raising your magic wand right. over everything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's definitely some, there's definitely plenty of room for some other stuff for sure. I mean, I, you know, I think that there's, where, where's the dim sum at? I think there's plenty of room in the breakfast space. I think there's, um, you know, I think there's the Middle Eastern Levant cuisine space. I think so. Right. I definitely think there's some some space in the market for sure. <laughs> so you I'm sound not gonna, like, I'm not going to say any more. No, okay, okay. Got <laughs> we'll hear about that on a future <laughs> yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. When you're not w- working, how do you maintain your six handicap? Uh, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Good, then we're going to take well, you yeah, out yeah, yeah, golf yeah. with this you. Is, this is your time, man. This yeah. is your what do you? Chance. You're right. These are your years. Well, what are what do you do when you want to let off some steam besides travel and uh, play I mean, travel? Travel's a big one, to be honest with you. Yeah, golf's big. I mean, just yeah, getting outside, getting in, getting onto the rivers, getting on the lakes, getting out in the woods. Um, just going out. I mean, I still love going out to eat, man. Don't get me wrong. Like, I mean, as much even though I'm in it all the time, like that is a great. That's still my all time favorite thing yeah. to do. And us too. Um, Number one, good. <laughs> so. What are, we, what are you eating tonight? Yeah. What are if, we going to eat? If you were to have another place up at Flathead Lake, another restaurant up in Flathead Lake, what would you do? I'd probably do ramen. Yeah. Word. In Big <laughs> Fork? I mean, if I was in Big Fork, I'd yeah. probably do ramen. What if you were in Lakeside? <laughs> I live near there. <laughs> <laughs> well, hmm, that's a good one. Maybe it's Italian. 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 Yeah. Italian is always a, is always yeah, a maybe salad. Italian because it's like there's a lot of good farms and stuff up there, yeah. and that, that lends itself to Italian. I would yeah. agree. And by the way, you know what I just heard turned over once again what? is uh, the lodge at Lake Mary Ronan, yeah. which is a great location, but, boy, are they encumbered by St- – Staffing is a different animal up there. It very yeah. much is, yeah. and a lot of – and land and just everything. But anyway, yeah. how, do we, how do we find out more about the new restaurant and your other restaurants? What's your website addresses? Your details. Um, yeah, so it's Sakatumi Sushi for and then Michi Ramen Bar. Those are both dot coms and then Florabella Missoula dot com. God. All right, Arnie. Drake, it's been too long. We're I know, have to man. Have you come, come back on. sooner this yeah, next yeah, time yeah, and sure. hear about your exploits and, and all your updates. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good, man. I would love that. Great, Drake, great to see you. Arnie, I'll see you next week. Good Take to see care, you guys. Scott. See you. Thank you for listening to What Do You Know? I can't wait for the next show, Scott. I'm excited too, Arnie. If you'd like to suggest a guest, send me an email at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com. We'll see you next week. And thanks for listening to News Talk KGVO. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Coriant. Coriant provides wealth management services centered around you. They focus on exceeding your expectations and simplifying your life. Coriant has been helping high achievers just like you enjoy their lives more fully, preserve their wealth, and provide for the people, causes, and communities they care about. As one of the largest integrated fee-only registered investment advisors in the U.S., Coriant has deeply experienced teams in 23 strategic locations. Coriant has extensive knowledge spanning the full spectrum of planning, 
planning, investing, lending, and money management disciplines. Leverage Corient's exclusive network of experts to craft custom solutions designed to help you reach your financial goals, no matter how complex they may be. Real wealth requires real solutions. For more information, connect with a wealth advisor today at Corient.com. That's C-O-R-I-E-N-T.com. Corient.com.